to this month's episode of the Crimmy Talk. I have the lovely Megan and Laura today with us. Lovely Hello. Megan and <laughs> Laura. Yeah. It's the first time we've got <laughs> Megan on the show and hopefully it's not the last. No. <laughs> <laughs> right, so today uh, we've teamed up and we're going to be talking about knife crime. We also have a special input from a specific criminologist that you will see later on. Um, so just starting... Um, just seen some latest facts recently regarding the knife crime and loads of media input in towards it um loads of stabbings etc in london recently and more across the united kingdom but there's been a main focus on um, london so i just want to see if um do you think knife crime is a recent issue to in society today or is it um well kind of both yes and no as in you know, if we take 2000, year 2017, so from 2016 to 2017, it's been, I think it's a 21% rise in knife crime. So can't really deny it is presently a problem. However, when we say it's like it's a recent problem, it implies that it's something that hasn't been historically. Yeah. Look at what we're commemorating this week. We're, we're looking at the death of Stephen Lawrence. Stephen Lawrence was killed over a quarter of a century or nearly a quarter of a century ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, through knife crime Mm -hmm. but i think just the way that we've traditionally kind of contextualized it is we've looked at the motive we've looked at is this a racially motivated attack is it a you know an attack um due to domestic violence is it you know the serial killing attack um and we've looked at you know like the type of offending so you know serial killer um is it you know is it gang related whatever now we're looking at the the kind of the weaponry use and we've kind of reconstructed it as though it's something new but if you look at like historically, obviously there was there was knife crime in Victorian London. You know, Jack the Ripper obviously used blades. Um, there was a lot of knife crime um, in the interwar period in two thousand and nine. Sorry, nineteen uh, nineteen in particular um, was was particularly bad for for knife crime. Mm-hmm. Teddy boys used to use you know sort of steel cones and, and and blades. So really, it's something that we've had in our society for quite some time, including in the capital. But the way that the, the particular sort of age demographic and also the, the way that we're kind of analysing it at the moment is is slightly different. I think the, the main concern is that it's people who are so young and also um, the message that it seems to be sending that they feel so abandoned and there's almost an element of you know people feeling that, that they need to carry them for, for self-defence that, mm-hmm. that's perhaps changed. Mm. Yeah definitely it is. Um, I'd agree with you with those points that you've made definitely um, and it is in relation to because it's almost that they're always especially with these stabbings that were in London a few weeks ago and um, they're always trying to ask for people to come forward with any advice and there's that fear factor that mm. people don't want to come forward with any anything they've seen or anything they know in case then word gets round that they're like a graph or they've given information and it's that kind of difficulty it is possibly in in trying to figure out what is happening and, and how you can yeah. solve it and find who's who's done them. In so saying that though, there are agencies, um I'm going a bit off tangent now, but there are agencies and um, you know, youth workers and mm. inner com- inner city community um workers that are trying to innovate the way that we think or see or perceive life crime mm. and not having a dig at politicians or anything. But I do think maybe they need to look back on like you say it's not an, it's not a recent issue mm-hmm. um, look back on what they haven't focused on maybe there's probably a implementation they can use along with people that are, have a first-hand understanding of it so mm-hmm. even if you're not getting the young persons coming forward and saying oh i witnessed this or i witnessed that you can work with community workers and a bit more of community engagement um, and see how as a society we can try and decrease the issue or even well to abolish it it's going to be a bit of a reach but Mm -hmm. um to see if there's any way that you know can lower the consequences or the rates of knife crime it's nice you don't want to dig up politicians but i will um but but you know to be honest i don't see how um how the, the you know the, the present government feel that it's it's appropriate or, or or in any way reassuring for the community for them to basically deny that there is a link between them cutting the police and 
not even the reality of people of people being able to be uh, caught with knives or, 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 or prevention of knife crime, but the community not feeling safe. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's obviously a massive link between the community and particularly young people in the community not feeling safe and carrying knives. Effectively, you know, I've spoken to several kind of um, you know sort of perfectly sort of normal people who think it's terrible that young people are carrying knives. When you actually talk to people and you say, if this was your circumstances, and say you're you're out with your say your younger brother or your sister or someone you feel like you need to protect, would you be told up? And the answer is usually yeah. yeah. Mm. And so if we're putting people in that situation, we need to understand that, that, that there's a consequence, you know, to that. And whether rightly or wrongly greater police numbers do seem to reassure the community it's that kind yeah. of the community police and the visual you know element of it having more people actually out there i think is reassuring for people so rather than talking about you know greater you know trying to re-increase stop and search with all the problems that that were associated with that i think perhaps we'd be better off looking at um levels of policing and the message that we're sending to young people when we're shutting down their community centers and to you know law-abiding members of the public when we're not having sufficient uh police numbers that actually you're on your own i think that's how a lot yeah. of people feel yeah yeah definitely because the main thing from reading up with these these recent stabbings in in london is that people are saying we, we just don't feel safe mm -hmm. in where we are in in what we're doing and definitely with the cutting police that, that obviously is is a result from that some, some form of results but. yeah no in saying that um mentioning obviously people don't feel safe etc do you think there are um any theories um obviously for our fellow watch viewers i was about to say watchers watchers um <laughs> wait watchers watchers <laughs> <laughs> um any theories that can help um explain the reasons why potentially people do um commit knife crimes yeah, yeah um the couple that I've, I've thought of is the like possibly the social learning theory which has recently mm. been relabeled as a social cognitive theory um, and this is just a theory that introduces the concept that behaviour is learned through social cues and the mm. behaviour of others mm. um, so relating this then to, to knife crime it, it could be seen that the use of a weapon or the carry of a weapon um, if that's seen in your social group or in your neighbour is just the norm thing to do which is mm. what you were saying before if it's you know, if you're given the reasons why it could happen, but it's then switched into a norm, the likelihood is that more people will yeah. carry a knife. Um, and then an another one on top of that, I'm not sure it's a, it's a theory, it's more of, a, of an effect that's been researched called the weapons effect, mm. where, um, and this is the idea that the presence of a weapon just increases the, the levels of aggression in either yeah. the individual holding the weapon or anyone that's in that social group that knows that there is someone holding a weapon that the whole level of the of aggression increases within within that group of people i think that's a really interesting point because i think that has kind of connotations for our understanding of things like joint enterprise yeah and that you know if you know your friends tooled up and you're part of that um you're part of that whole sort of situation whether or not you, you know you want to be held to um to account <clears throat> and I, I think <clears throat> so I definitely agree with you on the on social learning learning um, element of it as well I think one of the ways that we can try and understand this um, and I apologize if anyone thinks that I'm stereotyping I'm, I'm, I'm honestly trying not to but it's through understanding of of masculinity as well yeah. because it's I think it, it, it's pretty much undeniable that the majority of people who carry knives not all but the majority are male and are young yeah. men trying to assert themselves um, and trying to get either higher status within a group or just stop their status at, from being diminished and potentially being being rendered vulnerable or, or, or even being physically harmed. And I think with stop and search as well, traditionally obviously that's been used in a, in, in a very gendered way. Mm -hmm. So I think there is an understanding that it links to masculinity. But I don't think we're really at a stage yet where we know what to do about that. Mm. Apart from some of the, you know, trying to get former gang members and people who used to carry knives to explain the dangers of it. That's about as far as we seem to have got mm. in kind of really understanding why we still link masculinity with a propensity to, for, for violence and why, you know, we, we, we continue to do that. Another theory you could link that um, 
you're not going to be amazed that I disagree with it, but I'm going to I'm going to mention Go it anyway. It. You're always he's, the uh, devil's advocate. Come on. <laughs> he's, he, he's right realism. So I guess he'll a right realist would look at the situation and say, we've got a lot of fatherless sons. We've got a lot of family breakdown. Um, we've got a lot of people um, from an un- living in an underclass who are welfare dependent, who are not out there being um, well integrated, productive members of society. And therefore, we've got a situation where criminality occurs and, and violence occurs and knife crime's part of that. Um, I would personally contrast that with more of a strain theory perspective of these are these young good. people who... That's what it's great mind you <laughs> um, these are. These are young people who, um, you know, who are being told they must try to attain high levels of status, who must try to... Um, demonstrate again through masculinity you know sort of leadership qualities who need the right material things all the rest of it they're, they're hearing that message loud and clear from our sort of capitalistic society what they're not having is a societally approved um, method of getting there because they're not considered to be university material they're not considered to be the kids that are going to do very well in school they're not all going to be sports mm-hmm. stars so the only methods open to them are to get involved with you know with things like drugs and to um, and to, you know to use innovative methods if they want those things. I'm not saying it's not that, that they don't have any personal responsibility for it. They can choose to not attain those things, but they don't have the opportunities open to you know someone like me who's been to university and is and is perhaps able to fulfil a role in in my life that I like without those pressures being put upon me, mm-hmm. and also without feeling like I have to resort to offending behaviour. And I think sometimes. People who are fortunate enough not to be in that situation, we need to acknowledge that, that not everyone is. Um, the final one I had was sort of social was social disorganisation theory. So you know, effectively, we've got a high level of. You're smiling. I think you got that one as well. Um, no, I haven't got it on here. I've got um, a pack of notes somewhere. <laughs> um, I did write that. Down. Um, so basically, you know, the, the 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 geographical location as you mentioned, it's it's in in, in the capital in the inner city. Um, and also, you know, the high level of aggression and the breakdown of community, you know, right realists and elements of the right wing press like to talk about the breakdown of family units and how terrible feminism and sexual equality and all the rest of it has been for everyone. But sometimes we need to look at the rights traditional role in breaking down communities and community relations and that actually where you have well bonded, well structured communities, dare I say it, often dependent on manufacturing, you don't tend to get such high levels of toxic masculinity mm-hmm. and such high levels of um you know of of sort of underclass as they would put it based crime yeah mm-hmm. i feel no i'm like <laughs> literally like all these theories coming out I'm like, yes. it's good. <laughs> um, right. um so i sat down um the other day with the lovely criminologist craig pinkney and uh, yeah he was great absolutely great to be fair um he really knows his stuff um he's a, a gang extraction specialist i think mm-hmm. i've Ooh, I think that I've said that correct. Every time I say it, I get a bit tongue tied. Extraction he, he, is one of those yeah, words. I'm just trying to say myself. Yeah. But um, and he's worked in you know with inner city youths, combating gang violence, um, youth crime, violent crime, knife crime, etc. Um, and I thought we well, we all thought it was brilliant for us to uh, sit down and speak to him. Enjoy uh, the discussion. He's really knowledgeable. Um, if obviously you ever want to know anything specific in this field, I definitely advise you to get um, in some way, shape, or form in contact with him. Um, how did you find the bit work? Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, really interesting. Mm. Um, raised some stuff that I've, I think some stuff we've covered, but also some stuff we haven't really considered. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It was nice to get a varied opinion and mm. perspective. It would have been lovely to have him here to, um, with us on this actual show, but you I'm know, so yeah, fingers <laughs> crossed. Yeah. Um, and following on, um, what methods do you think should be implemented to prevent um, such issues such as knife crime? Um, I think one of the issues, and, and, and I understand it makes a lot of people go, oh, for God's sake, but it's happening now. But I think one of the things we have to do is look at root causes. And one of the problems is what immediately seems to deal with the problem, the sticking plastic bit, like, and I'll keep banging on about it, but like, stop and search being used very widely i'm not saying there's not even necessarily that there's no place for it but like it being used very widely um 
actually can exacerbate a long-term problem. So I think we need to look at kind of the, the root of why young people feel the need to carry knives. And I don't think we, you know, talked a little bit earlier about people not necessarily being able to empathise with those people. I don't think we understand, a lot of us, the emotional reaction that a young person, usually a young man has, when he realises he'd be, he'd feel a lot more confident in this situation if he had his knife with him and he hasn't got it. Mm. I think there's an emotional reaction, emotional terror that we don't in, properly engage in with. In a lot of scenarios, well not all, but a lot of scenarios regarding, you know, the carrying of weaponry and the carrying of knives, um, there are, as you said, the, the emotional aspect of it, there mm. are young boys, mm. are, there are young girls also, but um, especially, I'm going to focus more on the boys at the moment because it's a predominant issue with them. Um, but they have this, obviously, living in such communities where gang violence is a regular thing, like their daily mm-hmm. life, um, obviously wanting to feel protected. Then the emotional aspect, they've probably had friends that have been stabbed and murdered. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, so as you said before, how would you feel, you know, if you were speaking to someone else, how would you feel if you were to live that life? Obviously, we, you know, I can understand from a certain aspect why they carry the knives to feel protected to get over that emotional trauma that they've experienced um, mm. with regards to the loss of friends and family mm. and relatives and in their methods they feel as though obviously with funding cuts etc um they're not getting the assistance they need so they're going to take matters into their own hands kind I, of thing yeah. I, I know dr dr martin glenn actually kind of likens it in terms of the emotional reaction to the you know i don't know if, if viewers have heard of nanophobia you know where you where you have this fear of yeah. like losing your phone losing access to the internet losing your laptop all that kind of thing but but particularly with with phones and like dr glimms um suggested that, that it could be a similar emotional reaction that you have this thing in which you feel that you're dependent socially effectively and suddenly it's not there and i don't think we fully we fully understand that having said that the gun amnesty that we had um you know in the in the 90s work very very well and, and it, it is interesting that the knife we've tried numerous knife analysis and they just don't seem to be to be working in, in the same way but i think the police need to make uh, young people feel safer mm-hmm. and so obviously if you like I say increase stop and search that kind of thing doesn't necessarily make people feel that they can trust the police more yeah, i think you were yeah. talking earlier about um the need for people to feel comfortable and confident coming forward yeah. that's got to be fostered by a good relationship between um, communities and and the police. Police have obviously, you know, we've we've had um, recently um, commemorated the the murder of of Stephen Lawrence and, and also the criminals being the murderers being brought to justice. The, and I think that you know documentaries and, and stuff around that did highlight the police have come a long way, but there is still some way to go. Um, we've got to stop people from feeling that they have to take responsibility for their own safety we have to let people realize that the police can do their jobs and that that that's what they're there for and we also need to be as i think you were kind of alluding to um and i think you you know your conversation with 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 craig touched on um being receptive to young people's explanations as to why they carry knives Mm -hmm. and also not just look at it as immediately a criminal justice problem but also look at it as you know why are people, why are young people out on the streets in some of these incidental cases that happen where things get out of hand? Why do they have nowhere to go? Mm-hmm. Why can we yeah. not provide them with safe, structured spaces yeah. in which they can carry out, you know, non sort of non combative social interactions? And I think that's one of the one of the things we need to do because at the moment the message they're getting is you're on your own, you're not valued by society, and to be honest, you're creating a bit of a social problem. And if we can make people feel both more valued and as though you know they have they have or they can get the same kind of level of safety and the same level of success through um through more sort of socially friendly yeah. alternatives then hopefully we'll see a see a drop in knife crime mm-hmm. but more police on the streets as well yeah definitely yeah. needed yeah. theresa may get us some police officers <laughs> 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 I'm gonna cut that out. <laughs> don't! It's really good. Don't! Yeah, Teresa, I'm gonna could just say it every five minutes if you cut that out. I'm just gonna say it every two minutes. Okay. You can have a good night, mate. Okay. <laughs> the thing is, I can see on the YouTube video, if I cut it out, you'll be like commenting. Who the hell is Laura? Oh my god, it's Laura. Okay, MV. Alright, break it. I don't know what that was. <laughs> I don't know what that was. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, bringing it back. Um, and do you think there's any strategies or anything that needs to be implemented? Um, yeah, just just touching on what you were saying there, um, just about learning more how to de-escalate situation. Obviously, not it's not as simple as being educated on how to. Do you know what I mean? There's more to it. You gotta you gotta try and you gotta try and place it so it's it's practical and that it's it's realistically gonna work. Yeah. Um. But yeah, just. What, what I thought on was mainly just ed- education in terms of not implying that there's no education there in, in relation to what, what will happen if you mm-hmm. carry a knife, but just more possibly workshops where there's people there who are who have either carried a knife and something's mm-hmm. happened or they've been a victim of a knife attack or... It just make it a bit more... Um what's the word, visible, because there are, yeah. there are so many, like honestly, I was looking the other day at like workshops, the kind of workshops they bring to schools, yeah. and there's a lot of knife crime, but to know that I had to go looking for that, this as opposed it. to yeah. it just being there, is... Mm. Just... And let's be realistic as well, sometimes those, if you get them young enough, those that are the kids that are most likely to feel the need to carry knives, some of those kids are not in mainstream schools, some of those kids have yeah. completely slipped through the cracks, yeah. so... I completely agree with you, but I think and, and I think there's got to be some you know sort of like wider sort of community. Yeah, uh, definitely. Getting it instead getting of just being prevalent. in schools, trying yeah. to get it so it's more yeah. just yeah, just, just something, something that anyone can go to as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so that was our discussion today on knife crime, um, and it is our second birthday. Oh, this month. Yeah, so that <laughs> we've had a lovely little discussion, um, and no we featured. Oh, sorry, I'll take this for cake. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so that was our discussion on live crime. If there's anything, this is quite a sensitive topic, and it's quite relevant. In mm. it's going to be relevant for the future. It has been for the past, etc. Um, but if there's anything you want to add, um, or if you disagree with any opinions, if there's any theories you want to add, or any theories you didn't quite understand, and you want to, you know, want us to explain it a bit further, or put you point you in the right place to research it a bit better, um, just drop us an email, a tweet, anything. Um, you know, all our contacts will be at the end of this video. Thank you very much today, guys. Mm-hmm. It yeah, it'd be great as well if that's some of the examples that Megan was talking about. If anyone has any examples locally that they think are particularly good or whatever, it'd be great to hear mm. to hear of those because, as we're saying, it's good to see you and get a bit more recognition. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. See you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs>